but it can also be somewhat crippling. There's a beauty to naivety um, sometimes with certain projects. It's Sometimes it's good to not know. Um, yeah, sometimes it's really beneficial to not know what you're up against while you're making something. Hi there, I'm Mario. Welcome to another episode of Design Interview 10 Questions, where we interview designers from all around the world. Uh, today we do not really interview designer, but uh, an expert of design. She's a writer for iMagazine, Pulp and other uh, interesting magazines. Uh, she's Sarah Snipe. Uh, welcome Sarah, thanks for joining Design Interview 10 Questions. Thank you for the invitation. So, I would like to start with the first question that, of course, for you as a writer is a slightly changed and is what made you become a design writer? Okay, um, so uh, this is my second career, actually. Before I was um, in the design world, I was a dancer and I moved to London and <clears throat> was kind of in that shifting moment. and fell upon, a, a, strangely enough, a clearing day at the university and sat down and read there while I was supporting a friend going to an interview and uh, sat down and read the prospectus and got chatting to somebody in the design department. And by the end of the conversation, they went, we'd like to offer you an unconditional offer. Join us. I was like, uh, anyway, what? <laughs> what just happened? So it was like, it kind of fell, fell in my lap in a way. Um, in that transition period between careers, I'd been working in a theater in Toronto, in a castle theater on the soundboard. Lots of random jobs in my past. <laughs> and I've uh, been doing set dressing for them. And I've been doing lots of drawings as plans of the, of the sets, but didn't want to be a set designer. So I studied design. Um, and then in that sort of part of my education found that illustration and writing were the two things I was most interested in and I pursued writing. So I studied design writing criticism at London College of Communication and uh, while I was writing my thesis uh, John got in contact with me because they were planning the food issue which ended up being years away <laughs> um, and I was writing about um, in representations of food in independent food magazines. So yeah. So that's that's the kind of path from through education and to I. But at the beginning, when you changed from like be a dancer to writing about design, was it difficult? <laughs> Especially I don't know maybe because you didn't know all the techniques, all the stuff regarding design. I have a BA in, in design, so in that sense, my education prepared me for the writing aspect. Um, as of I mean, this isn't I'm not unique to me, but I have a personality where I, I'm really interested in learning more than anything. And and so design writing has given me the opportunity to try to learn everybody else's job in a way. Um, it's a nor it's incredibly uh, social in another sense. You do you spend lots of time with other people. Um, also lots of time alone. I think it's probably the two extremes. You spend a lot of time as a writer with designers in their space trying to sort of pick their brain. And then a lot of time alone reflecting on that and um, standing back and coming up with your own ideas and observations of work. But um, yeah, the learning aspect of it is the, is the exciting part, I think. So the write, writing about design was is just a new way of thinking and, and then helping other people who are readers as the writer to see things through a different perspective than they would without you. And what is then design for you? Because I guess it's not just the subject of your articles. No, no. I mean, I, again, I'm probably going to say something other people have said, but design is absolutely everywhere um, and is in every part of our lives, whether it be good or bad, <laughs> depending on your opinion and your experience and contact with it. Um, what is graphic design? I don't know how useful that is. I think every year that I've been teaching, I have a student who proposes to write their thesis about the different, to analyze the difference between art and graphic design. And through a very short amount of time, we they come to the conclusion, which I'm always pleased about, that it's not useful to their career to have, to draw a hard line. And that graphic design has always been a very adaptable practice. Um, 
it has to be a kind of resilient and adaptable, flexible practice. And so to draw hard lines is really dates that thinking because we're going to keep evolving. The practice is going to keep evolving. So to set those lines is really to position that thesis in the, in the moment really in that year that graph design might look different next year. It might look different again. It may not be noticeable in the moment. We may need some time to reflect and see those changes, but they will they will come. So I don't know that there's anything useful to say this is what graphic design looks like. And given the situation we're in now with the world, I don't think we know what our discipline's going to look like, especially if you work in arts and culture, sort of for cultural institutions. How are, how is our work going to change in that in the time that maybe we continue to socially distance? So it's going to change again. So maybe drawing a hard line isn't useful. What's your goal when you uh, write about design? I mean, of course, yeah, to inform people is the first, but I don't, I don't remember now, but for example, Massimo Pittis from uh, Pittis Associati, a design studio here in Milan, he said that once he talked to, uh, I don't remember the name of this person, but uh, this person said, my goal is to reach all kind of people and make them learn what design is. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with that. I think, um, I mean, right now I'm in Argentina. So I've been in Argentina for nine months um, and it looks like I'm staying, <laughs> um, at least at least through the rest of this um, crisis we're in. Uh, and, and I think on a personal level, my motivations change depending on what's happening in the world. Um, so I'm not speaking for the magazine in this moment, but I came here on holiday the first time. Um, I'd met a couple of designers, Argentine designers, uh, at an Aji event in Mexico and decided to come here on holiday. And in that holiday, did nine interviews in 10 days. Just wanted to really wanted to quickly meet the design industry. And you start to you begin to start to have a picture of the context of design in this country or in this continent a very loose understanding of the continent, but of the country. And that was so exciting to me, to try to understand another culture, another language, another a set of goals from clients, and a different audience in terms of the population, expectations, and how to push those expectations. So at the moment, my focus is on um, finding spaces for uh, work from South American designers. But, I mean, I've spent lots of time personal interest, I've written a lot of um, pieces about women designers and um, people doing work that perhaps, again, exists on those borders of what would traditionally be considered graphic design. So I write a lot about dance as well. <laughs> um, and how does it work when you write an article? Like, how, how which are the steps? Okay, so... Can... Um, I've work, been working with John Walters for eight years, and I have, I, I'm both someone who works in-house, I do, I did used to work in-house, I now work remotely, but with John, I mean, at the same time here, um, and then I'm also separately from that, a freelance writer, so I write for the magazine on a, in a freelance capacity, and then I work in-house doing um, the day-to-day -day things, so that's online and editing and proofreading and, uh, and events and all other things we do. Um, so it depends. I mean, I don't know how, uh, do you get copies of Pulp? Yeah, uh, a couple. You, yeah. Okay, so so Pulp is another magazine, this, exactly the same team does Pulp. The, uh, so Pulp's um, for Pedregoni paper. And those two magazines are really, really different, uh, but have lots of things in common. And maybe the difference is I probably pitch more for I, but I'm probably commissioned more for Pulp. So there's sort of two ways. You either Find find a story yourself and try to sell it to your editor, <laughs> whatever editor that is. Um, and then if they decide to take it, they give you a word count. And then you uh, usually try to make them give you more <laughs> words by writing uh, something uh, beyond what they were what they had in mind. Uh, I like to do my interviews in person, if possible. Um, obviously, that's not always possible. A recent, relatively recently interviewed. Minchaya Chaya Sumrit in uh, Thailand, and I couldn't go to Thailand to meet her, 
but um, I hope I will meet her at some point. I think for me, the the personal, like the person to person contact is really exciting because you get someone's energy. And when a designer is really excited about what they've just made, it's infectious in the best possible way. And that energy I then take to the pitch, which I then give to the editor and the editor gets excited too. And then, and then the energy of the piece really starts, um, start, you know, starts on that foot. But uh, writing is also like so time consuming and torturous and not easy. <laughs> my, uh, my students often say to me like, but you, you know, this is what you do for a living. It's really easy. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> I promise you, I do so much pacing. I walk. Uh, a, a lot before the quarantine I walk a lot to think so it's not like a chilled I have this is this is super easy kind of experience um but no I mean I think that the kind of torturous side of it is where you're learning and teaching and formulating and crafting the words that are like I said helping people observe that work in a different way it's contextualizing that work in in its own country and also in a kind of historical perspective and uh, and then there's the huge editing process. So uh, mag uh, magazines like I are are really well edited. Um, lots of energy is put into editing. So some I have other experiences with some other magazines where I submit an article and it more or less is published as I submitted it, and that's not the case at I. So there's a whole process once it's submitted. And in I magazine, uh, like your uh, influence, like you said, you, you feel a lot when you interview people uh, face and face. So you, you also influence somehow the, 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 the graphic aspect while they are designing the article, layouting the article in the page or? I mean, in a, in a kind of discussion, conversational sense. Um, Simon and Holly are very much, uh, are very much the, the masterminds behind the layouts. but. Of course, there are moments where you feel strongly about a, a particular image sort of having its moment and, and also being present. I think sometimes, too, I mean, I, for example, in I-98, I wrote a piece called The Business of Type Design, where I interviewed 18 type foundries. It's a 2,500 word article, but my transcripts from the 18 interviews are more than 50,000 words. They're somewhere between 50 and 70,000 words. It's like a you know, a stack of paper. So in that moment, you I know what I've cut, but things I would have liked to keep but couldn't. And then you have a different idea about, okay, maybe I've got some caption space to mention this. I think there's that happens where you think, wait a minute, maybe I can get this idea or this interesting statement in there because readers will find it interesting, but it didn't necessarily quite fit into the, the body of the piece. So in that sense, there's a discussion. But uh, no, the, the design is definitely uh, in Simon and Holly's hands. Yeah, sure. But uh, yeah, I think I have the sensation in high is a kind of family and you work all together to make the every issue, actually. Yeah. So Holly and I started um, within three weeks of each other. So we've been we've been there for the, <clears throat> the duration together. Um, and Holly works with Simon and I work with John. Obviously, our external team is enormous of proofreaders and sub-editors and contributors and and then all the other people who do things like distribute the magazine and print and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, it's Simon and Holly, John and myself, and then Janet, who's um, the glue. <laughs> She's our business manager who keeps uh, everything ticking on. So, yeah, no, we are like a, a family making things. Um, I think it's so we added a pulp in 2014. And that is such a different dynamic to making that magazine and the way that we do it, the system for making it, um, <clears throat> because we do have a client, um, that we have a different dynamic for both and, and we can kind of go between the two in a way. Um, and if it, to some extent, we, we have had the opportunity to pitch something for, I swear we have like pitch something for pulp and then it's caught attention from Simon and John and we've thought, oh, maybe we'll do that in the future in I. So there is a little bit of like that opportunity to write about someone that perhaps we aren't hearing about as often in other places and think, actually, this might have a bigger position in the kind of historical setting to put it into, into I. As a designer, uh, I think it's really important to observe 
what surround me and also all the works. But I, I think for you is probably the most important part in, in your writing career. Um, do you think looking at thinking about all the works you have seen in your life, that perfection exists in design? Oh, um, <laughs> perfection exists. Let's think. You don't um, need to quote any name. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there are some perfectly appropriate pieces of design um, in their moment, in their context, and in their method of production, definitely. Um, are they going to be perfect forever? Would they be perfect if they were made exactly the same now? No. But in the moment, yes, of course. There are moments where you think, Whoa. I mean, I um, I watched your interview with Rajani Del Wallo and you were talking about Wolfgang Weingart and I, I would definitely, you know, there's, there are pieces of his work that you think, wow. Um, I interviewed him in um, Zurich some years ago when he had a, he recently donated his collection to the Museum for Gestalting and he was there. Uh, I came from London to <clears throat> to interview him and had all these questions prepared. I was like, I just read his book. I was super excited. I was like, so I really see this architectural features in your, in your, in your work. And it feels so three dimensional. Is this really what you're aiming to do? He's like, no. He's like, oh, okay. Um, not at all. If it's there, not on purpose. It's like, right. <laughs> okay. And, and you, you know, you can, you can be sort of, bubbling with excitement for somebody else's work and perhaps not that he wasn't but but he just wanted to hear about his friends he wanted to talk to me about everybody in london like how's this person how are they how's their work going is their studio okay and you know it was the people he wanted to talk about he was in a way um in that moment not interested in talking about that poster or that type experiment he'd done and, and you have this moment where you think like okay we can hold up these things but they, they, like, even for the maker of them, they've changed. The dynamic of them has changed for them too. So I don't know. Perfection is a kind of tricky one, but I, I think it's interesting. I would agree that there are some of his works that are uh, incredible. I mean, I've held onto some books. I own a few books that I think this is absolutely perfect. But you know, another another beautiful book will come along that also feels just as perfect for its um, material. And. I guess it's uh, really interesting for you as a writer uh, to also compare the contemporary uh, way to design with the past, for example, with Wolfgang Weingart. Um, what, what, what's your uh, opinion regarding the now about the contemporary design? Oh, gosh, you're, <laughs> this is a tricky question. Um, I mean, I look, obviously, I'm, uh, design history is of great importance to me. Um, I don't write a lot of historical pieces. I mean, you obviously have to have a, a, a in-depth knowledge of the history of design, design in order to write about it, uh, write about design, contemporary design, but I don't know that I'm sort of constantly doing that comparison. I don't know that how much we get, how much we, how much value we gain from, from constantly comparing. Um, in my yeah, dance research, I... Maybe, well, I mean, sometimes I, I like to think, like, I, to look at one piece, like, for, I don't know, from an Italian graphic designer, and it looks like, uh, I don't know, a Japanese graphic designer, you know, because now also in contemporary design, there's no more uh, borders, you know, because now with online content and so on, mm -hmm. I mean, it's really open, right? Yeah, I mean the internet is a a space where yeah it's it's offers a lot for like you know in terms of exposure to materials, um, in lots of ways. Uh, it can also I don't know the the I can say that with students um, it can also be kind of crippling the the volume of material can be somewhat crippling because you can look and think someone's done it better than me and I could never do that. And, and actually, it tends to tends to scare or scare off the the most talented students is is the abundance of material they can find elsewhere that is 
that they feel is better, is more accomplished than than theirs. Um, and th- that's kind of a, that's a kind of sad moment more than a happy one, where you think, oh, there are moments where <clears throat> where this is an incredible reference if you know how to navigate it, um, if you've been taught how to navigate that kind of space. Um, but it can also be somewhat crippling. There's a beauty to naivety um, sometimes with certain projects. It's sometimes it's good to not know. Um, yeah, sometimes it's really beneficial to not know what you're up against while you're making something. Um, in terms of the, the question is, can, what, do, what do I think of contemporary design? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I'm gonna just like point your attention to something else. Um, have you seen Briar Levitt's film Graphic Means? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, it came out a few years ago, four years ago, three years ago. Um, I mean that that film shows that we keep that we keep changing. When we need to change, we change. That there are technological shifts that have drastically altered the way in which we make design. Um, I mean, there's a, there's the example of how women become a big part of the design industry during strike action. That when we were shifting from um, compositing from some kind of compositors and from lead type to to um, other means and the shift towards digital and this these moments just show how much we're adaptable in this moment in this contemporary moment i think graphic design is incredibly broad i think that's bringing us some interesting new pieces of work and new approaches to work i don't think there's necessarily one way of learning how to be a designer i think there's lots of paths to being a designer as well but in the terms of like like, what do i think of the future and how where we're going I hope we're just as resilient and adaptable as we have been in the past because um, we face some new challenges, definitely. But yes, uh, graphic design is in an interesting moment of flux and will probably continue to be in that moment of flux. And what, what do you think about the impact of internet that had on design? Oh, I mean, huge. Uh, I mean, huge for lots of reasons. Um, access to materials, not needing to have the budget to purchase a huge range of books to be informed about the history of design. But it made it a lot harder, too, uh, in terms of understanding the history. I have, um, again, referencing my students, uh, every year I have, in, since 2016, since the American presidential election, I've had lots of students wanting to write about fake news, and that being a starting point for these for theses and and in that you open a discussion about truth and trust where do we to ask a student who do you trust and what is truth what is truth is an enormous question very difficult to answer but who do you trust is a val is a valid question and it and how to navigate who like what your system is for doing that is an interesting reflecting point to have someone think about um, where they place their trust in terms of news media and beyond news media, where do you, where do you place your trust in terms of design, of, you know, of, of design publications, of narratives about all sorts of things? And are you putting one thing, which actually people don't necessarily realize lots of more or less press releases are published by some platforms versus a critical piece of writing? And students, my students don't often differentiate and understand like once it's pointed out to them, they do. But the difference between a, a kind of piece of marketing and a piece of critical writing. So those those things, I think, learning how to navigate, navigate the internet, if you've grown up with it, you don't necessarily have the kind of critical eye you need to navigate those spaces. And and it's something that does need to be learned. Something definitely needs to be learned. So it, it makes information available, but it doesn't necessarily... Um, not everyone has the tools to navigate that space and understand where they should place their their um, trust, and and then how to have their own opinion outside of that, that is inf- an informed opinion, not just a kind of Twitter uh, rant. <laughs> Often mention your students, and how do you see design education today? So um, I think there's lots of paths to design. I mean, I think we. I, very long time ago, we made a shift in, in I'm going to kind of mention the Canadian system 
uh, which exists, this kind of two-tiered system works in lots of other countries too, but we went from a vocational and academic path where graphic design was previously perhaps on a vocational path or was on a vocational path and shifted across to an academic path. Um, and it means that at the university level, we're not teaching the technical skills. We're not sitting down and doing a kind of InDesign 101. This is how to make a magazine. But, you know, this is how to make a magazine in terms of the tools. We are more interested in teaching what it, what it, what does a magazine do? What is its what is it trying to do? I don't know. I mean, I have a copy of I here. It, with I, for example, um, I'm not sure that we would, John and I would completely, or Simon, John and I, or Holly would completely agree on this, but I think there's lots of entry points. So this is, I is a particularly interesting magazine because there are lots of different opportunities and different kinds of reading experiences you can have. So you could flip through and only read the headlines and stand firsts and have an understanding of the content. And you could sit down and just read the captions and also be informed at a level. Um, we are very careful to make sure that designers' names and credits are really um, partly are just as much as some duplication in terms of the articles and the captions. But if you only read the captions, you would take away some knowledge. And then separately, you have the articles. And as a unit, it's one big reading experience, but there's lots of little ones. That's more the kind of conceptual side of a magazine is what you teach at university, not the technical skills. Um, and more than anything, we're hoping, the hope. I, I used to say that the as an educator, you're trying to teach someone to be curious. But uh, I was very rightly. <laughs> um, I did an interview with Michael Wolf several years ago, and he said, I don't think you can teach curiosity. You can wake it up, which is a good point. You can wake up yeah. curiosity. So design education's job is to wake up curiosity in someone, to teach them how to see the world through a different lens, to observe it um, perhaps more precisely or differently, to, to witness systems, to understand the complexities of things, to take them at more than surface value. Um, but there are also lots of interesting, I mean, more and more pop up all the time. There are technical, te in terms of technical skills, spaces like, Skillshare and Domestica, where you can take a class from a design hero. In some uh, instances, some you know very very well established uh, voices in design, and and you don't have to do the nine thousand pounds a year kind of um, UK university. But those are really different things. I think it depends on the kind of person and the and the kind of thinker they are, and that the time you spend in university is about making connections learning how to think, giving yourself time to explore, experiment, fail. And doing that outside of an education environment is incredibly difficult to not having that space, very cliche, but the safe space to, to make and fail and be criticized and improve. Um, and then the, what happens, the dynamic between students. I am worried about the cost of education <laughs> in general. I'm very worried about the cost of education, um, limiting talented students from engaging in education, but uh, in Argentina, the education is free. Uh, university education is free. Um, they have enormous class numbers, but um, everybody gets in and really not everybody finishes. So uh, there's a kind of flipped system here. Most, you know, it's, it's, most people don't finish, but you end up, the people you do end up with are very talented. But you maybe started with 600 and finished with 60 at the end of a four-year degree. So, um, but you know, the the fact that it's free is really quite impressive for me. Another interesting topic for me is like the role of the designer in the future. And I mean, yeah, yeah, please. I am going to give you an example of somebody I met here because. Uh, well, wow, because there's lots of interesting things happen here and you probably don't know her name. And I don't know that it's the model for everybody, but there there are designers have so many skills beyond, as we all know, beyond perhaps what a, a person on the street would say a graphic designer does versus what does graphic designers know they do. And uh, a designer here called Marina Pla, who is a, a graphic designer who does has all of your uh, kind of identity clients and 
you know, a, a wide range of, of clients and uh, a portfolio of work. But uh, in her in her understanding of systems and of the power of visual communication, she has started an initiative called, uh, well, the English translation is Repair Club. And she has made these open source packs that other countries can pick up and run with. They can use her designs and put in their information and run repair clubs where um, local people who, for example, fix electronics, fix, uh, know how to bind books, know how to sew, come and volunteer their time. And people from the community bring their objects and get them fixed, learn how to fix them. That's the difference, learn how to fix them. But she fills these spaces with letterpress posters she's made with local printers here. She invites speakers to come talk about design and um, sustainability. So yes, you're inviting people to a free event to fix their speaker. In fact, I took uh, this speaker there and fixed it in 15 minutes. I was baffled that a cheap Chinese um, speaker could be taken apart and completely resolved and that I understood how to fix it within 15 minutes. But once you're in the space, she uses the, her other kind of skills, her network of people, her interest in uh, the sort of critical aspects of design and design's future to give regular people who have things they need fixing to involve them in our, in our, um, in our world. And I think that kind of use of your skill set and then making it open source and available to other people to run with a, a model like that is so interesting. Um, I mean, she's not the only person in terms of graphic design looking at sustainable sustainability and the future. But I think that's a really nice example of someone going, I have a practice, I have a skill set, I have a personal interest. Um, what can I do with that? And it really serves the community here. Um, they're great events. They're really fun. There's always live music and talks and you know, people have their dogs running around. It's great. It's a, it's a really interesting experience. There was woodworking recently. There was, like I said, a book binder. So someone really from our, our, uh, our world someone fixing musical instruments, it really fascinating sort of space to go and to run into other people in, in the design community, but also regular people and to have a conversation with regular people. So um, I think there's a there's space for graphic designers to, to think about their community and global initiative, like things that need to happen for the world and how we can how we can participate in those things, but without losing sight of our own sort of personal interests and personal path in terms of our businesses. Unfortunately, we already arrived to the last question, but um, what what do you think the design world can do now for this global pandemic? Do you think we can give some help for this? Or? Yeah, so it's funny. Before I um, before we started talking, I was looking at I ninety nine uh, in a kind of studying my own job. <laughs> we started talking and it's interesting so in our uh, in the editorial john writes um the graphic design rests on a transactional network from client to studio to final output and of course that is uh, how things usually run but maybe we're in a time where we need to flip that model i think there's lots of especially those um working in the cultural industry we need to help our clients um adapt so, for example, uh, Zach Kais has just posted, it's, it's everywhere, on, 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 online saying culture is not cancelled. And he's saying institutions need to keep our deadlines and they need to keep, um, to remember that, you know, graphic design is important. And I absolutely agree. But I think it's also our responsibility to help our clients while they're fl floundering in this moment. We're all unsure of, of what our future looks like and work together to... Um, come up with strategies for continuing social distancing if we have to. So if there are going to be no big group events, if there are going to be no public exhibitions with hundreds of people and the energy that hundreds of people bring to a space, what can design do to bring those experiences to an audience? And in that, in that transaction, in that moment where, for example, an exhibition is brought to an audience, maybe there's an opportunity to reach a new audience that we weren't already reaching. So what can design do to reach new audiences in this moment? Um, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. And, and hopefully not just, it has to be more than just surviving. We have to hope that we aren't just trying to stay afloat, but that we're able to innovate in this time.
um, where possible. But do you think also the, the work we we need to do, as you said, now uh, is also something that will influence what will be afterwards? Yeah, I mean... Maybe we can change the way to work and flip, as you said. I mean, um, if I'm being completely honest, uh, while a lot of my job I'm by myself, I'm finding quarantine really difficult. There are moments where I'm like, I just need to go for a walk. Uh, we are on full lockdown and not allowed to uh, be more than a kilometer from our home. And you're supposed to go to the nearest grocery store, the nearest pharmacy. And mine are about half a block away. So I haven't walked in a long time. And you have this moment where you think like, okay, what can I do with this energy? Um, I don't know. I think I think we have to kind of, it's a very small action, but they're just people continuing, the design industry continuing to publish things on their Instagram saying, stay home. It is helping. It is working. In a way, it seems you, you could look at it and say it's a very small gesture. It's one image or three images, but just a little reminder that to keep going is incredibly useful. At least I'm finding it useful. Every day I look at Mario Eskenazi's uh, feed and he's like, day 33, stay home. And you're like, stay home, we can do this. You know, there's there's a kind of, there's many layers to that message, but I think um, just keeping it simple too, some days is to go, you're right, Mario, I just gotta stay home. Um, so I don't know, I think there's, there's lots of levels that we can participate. I think talk series like this is useful, having other people's voices and and feeling their energy, because I think we're probably all missing the opportunity to chat and feed have feedback from our office mates and people that we spend time in our studio with or we go for lunch with. Um, I miss those interactions. That's how you I push an article forward. I'm sure that's how you push your design forward. Like, yeah, I'm working on this project. I'm kind of stuck. Someone's like, have you seen this? And you think, oh yeah, that. You know, we're not getting those. Uh, we don't have that opportunity at the moment. So we have to find new ways to have those kinds of experiences to keep ourselves fired up in a way, to keep ourselves motivated and 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 feeling inspired in new ways. Sorry, inspired is really cliched, but we do need to keep an energy that we that we're missing by not being around other other designers. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. It was really nice to talk to you. Thank nice you. to talk to you too. Um, and thank you so much. This is a, a great initiative. I'm really glad to be part of it. Thanks, and take care. Yeah, you too.